I am the co-president of um, the American Association of University of Women for this year, and my other co-president is Judy Adams. Judy, wave your hand. Our president-elect <laughs> is Mary Kopp. Mary, you want to raise your hand over there? And I'd like all the women in, in AAUW, please, to hold your hands up. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight um, supporting this event. Our mission in AAUW has always been about equity. Primarily, people know us for gender equity. Um, they know us for equity in education, equity in the workplace. But I think that um, we also have to think in broader terms. And I got thinking, and we all started talking about equity in our community uh, for newcomers. Uh, from different cultures in different places and thought it would be an idea to have a public forum where we might share information, answer questions that people might have, um, and in general uh, kind of get a sense of where we are right now. I know that while we were planning this, uh, the International Center, um, I'll be sure I got my names right, the, the International Center um, hosted a volunteer uh, event a few weeks ago, um, and I, you know, f even finding that out, felt like we should still go on and have this discussion um, tonight because maybe we could meet some different uh, different needs or reach some different kinds of people. I want to thank our panel tonight uh, for joining us. Uh, to my immediate right is Diane Ford, as you know, the director of of the International Center. Um, next to her, I mean, we've, we've moved around on my list, is Laura Jones, um, who works in education and works with children's programming. Next to her is Bruce Kunze, who's going to talk a little bit about some temporary housing, transportation, uh, maybe some about the uh, dental program a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Next to him is Tom Cameron. Tom's going to talk about a language and English program that we have going on. And at the far end of the table, um, we have Nancy Bradshaw, who's going to talk about the warehouse program. Um, so with any, uh, oh, one other thing. Um, we're going to let Diane begin with an overview, and then each of the other presenters uh, will speak for up to 10 minutes. Um, they've threatened me. They've said they're probably going to go back and forth a little bit. And I told them, that's okay. Just let everybody have a chance. The second point I'm going to make is that we're going to ask you to hold questions until the end of the presentation. On your chairs, you found cards and pens. If you're like me and have the short-term memory of a nap these days, if a question comes to you, go ahead and write it down. Lots of times I think we find in these situations we have a question and someone else answers it later on. And um, secondly, rather than focusing on one, one particular area, this will give us a chance uh, to let everybody talk about their different areas and then we can open the floor for questioning. Um, some, I'm going to ask a couple, Edna and maybe a couple of the other AAUW women, that if, they, if you see someone hanging a card out the end of the row sometime, pick it up, and if you kind of hang on to it, I'll pick those cards up at the end of the presentation, and we'll respond to those questions. We'll try to respond to all the questions in the time we have given. Um, if, if you want to stay once those questions are answered and informally um, talk with anybody on the panel or any of us in AAUW, we'd certainly be glad to do that. We have a table of information up here about the International Center's program, so we have a table about AAUW if you're interested in our organization. Okay? All right. Well, then, without any further ado, I'm going to turn this podium over to Diane Ford, who's going to speak. And Diane, this is the mic, and that's the recording mic. By the way, you are being videoed and recorded this evening. <laughs> It's not live streaming, but it's videoed and recorded. Well, good evening. Can you all hear me okay? In this microphone? Thanks, everyone, for coming. We weren't sure what to expect, but this is a wonderful crowd and glad to see so much support for our refugees. As she said, I'm Diane Ford, the current site director of the International Center of Kentucky. Um, for those of you who don't know, 
We are a, uh, an agency that is contracted through USCRI, the United States Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. So we, USCRI, it's a very complicated process, but they are contracted through the State Department. So they're our federal funder. So 70% of our, of our funding comes from USCRI. 30% of that funding goes through the Kentucky Office of Refugees. So a lot of people get confused about whether we're federally funded or state funded. All of our money comes from ORR, which is the Office of Refugees and Resettlement. So we do receive all of our funding for our clients from the federal government, but some of it goes through a pass-through entity, which is called KOR. Many of you are probably familiar, but most of it, 70%, comes from USCRI. So there are nine agencies across the country, similar to USCRI, that contracts with smaller agencies like ours to resettle all the refugees that come into the United States. So for Owensboro, um, just to give you an idea, I was looking at our data right before I left. Um, just within the past year, we have resettled into Owensboro over 200 Afghans, over 60 clients from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which does include Somalia and Ethiopia. Um, 10 Ukrainians, which not all of those live here. We are um, currently serving some that live in Madisonville and Evansville that don't have another agency that can help them, so we're servicing them as well. Um, eight Burmese, and we are currently getting ready to resettle um, a large group from Colombia. Uh, so we expect, with the new administration, with the numbers that were put out, we expect the largest portion of our upcoming fiscal year for 23, the refugees will come from probably Africa, we'll continue to get some from Afghanistan, and then we'll, we'll get a lot from Rohingya, just because of the persecution and the conflict there. So that gives a little bit of demographic information about where our current population has come from in the past year. So when we receive clients into our agency, they first come, we do intake into what we call <coughs> RMP, which is our Reception and Placement Program. That is the program where we provide them housing, we get them a social security card, we make sure they have a medical card, a food stamp card, uh, we enroll their kids in schools. All of that stuff has, has to happen within the first 90 days along with employment. That's Reception and Placement. So we have 90 days to get all of those things done. Within those 90 days, we also have to make a decision where we put those clients in, in the next program that, that they will enter into after 90 days. So there's a program called Match Grant. It's a federally funded program, again, that all the money comes from USCRI. Typically, we only get a certain number of slots each quarter or fiscal year, depending upon how ORR decides to do it, and we reserve those slots for families. We pay their rent and utilities for up to eight months, and they get a little bit of cash to help them along the way. So we try to reserve those spots for the larger families with children. If they're not in match grant, they go into a program called RCA, which is Refugee Cash Assistance. Within that program, they do not get their rent and utilities paid for, but it's a 12-month cash assistance. They get a little bit more cash, but they have to work. Oh, and in the match grant program, they have to work as well, but it's a bit more stringent in RCA. So they don't get their rent and utilities paid for, but they receive more cash. So as the client comes in, our approach in our office, we're a small office, there are only eight of us right now, we sit down at the table, we've met the clients, and we have a, a long discussion about what's best for that client. Are they employable? Do they have any barriers to employment? How are they going to do with ESL? Because they're required to go to ESL to receive whichever funding in whichever program they, we might put them in. So it's important to us, every single one of us, whether it's a youth program coordinator, a medical coordinator, we want them to be in, the, in a successful program because their integration and successful long-term integration depends on us getting them the right job, helping them with that funding. And if we mess up in the beginning and we put them in the wrong program, then we, that might be the barrier that prevents them from, from really being successful. And in our mind, success is not putting them in, a, in one job, low entry, base level pay, 
keeping them there, not learning English, and not advancing. So what we've really tried to do in the last six or seven months is look at their skill set. Really, I'm looking at Lindsay Kafer. She knows we've been working on the ESL and trying to strengthen our ESL and opportunities for ESL so that they can get better paying jobs and get the training that they need, hopefully, to get more advanced level jobs. Because we know that in order for them to really be here and be successful and create the diverse opportunities that we all want for Owensboro, we have to give them that. We can't just bring them here, give them a house, give them a medical card, give them a food stamp card, and then say we've done our job. We do not want to be a funding entity. We want to be a support system for them, and we want them to feel welcome, and we want to give them the resources that they need to really build a life here. So that's how we make our decisions. Um, I, don't, I can't speak for the past and what's been done in the past, but that's how we operate, and that's kind of our mission uh, when the clients come in. So it takes a village, and I'm looking in this room, and I see many faces of so many people that helped during what we call the hotel stay. And I know lots of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It took our entire community to do what we did to receive 167 Afghans in three months, to house them, to feed them, to provide them medical transportation, and beyond that, to love them. And I will tell you that they feel that love Many of them wanted to go, planned to go, planned to get their documents, move to other communities, other states where their families and friends live in Virginia and California, and they have chosen to stay. And they've chosen to stay because of what you did, because you showed up, because you took them to the doctor, because you invited them to church, because you helped enroll their kids in school, because you brought them lunch from Pizza Hut, which didn't mean anything to you, but it meant something to them. You took care of them. You brought them diapers and fruit and all, oh my goodness, all kinds of fruit and beer trimmers. Nancy, how many beer trimmers did we buy <laughs> in the hotel? <coughs> Those are the things. And so I'm taking this moment to thank every single one of you who've shown up because you have convinced them that Owensboro is a place that they want to be. And they tell me that every single day. And not only do they say that, they're bringing their friends here. I can't tell you how many secondaries. A, a guy from Alaska came the other day. One of our clients brought two guys in, and one of them came all the way from Alaska and said, I want to live in Owensboro. That's how much they love it here. And it's because of what you did. It's not because of what we did. It's because of what all of us did. And so I want to take a moment to thank you for that. Um, so that's how we operate. Our, our mission in our office is to take care of our client, to go above and beyond. You know, humanitarian, being compassionate in that humanitarianism should not be subjective, I guess. It shouldn't be based on where you come from, how much money you have, what religion you practice or believe in. We should do that for every single person that comes into Owensboro, and that's how we feel. If you walk in our door, and whether you're our client or not, even if you're an undocumented person, but we can give you, I can send you to Nancy and she can give you some dishes to put in your kitchen, we're going to do it because that's what, Owen, we believe that's what our volunteers who donate those things, that that's what they intend for those donations. We want to help people who need help. So once we get through the process of making those tough decisions and putting them in the right programs, we try really hard to pair them up with with youth mentors or family mentors, people who can check on them weekly. The cultural integration into Owensboro is as important as anything. Um, for some of our refugees, Afghans excluded primarily, but for the others, plumbing, electricity, those are things that are not just learned in a few weeks. Yes, we do that cultural orientation, but they need that ongoing support of, oh, remember that jar of opened marinara sauce and that meat and cheese and milk, that does not go in your cabinet. Let's put that back in the fridge. So those are the things that are just constant reminders and don't put your food down the drain because the landlord is eventually going to get frustrated. Um, you know, one thing I'll say about Owensboro is the stumbling block for us was housing, but we've come a long way. The property owners are really being patient with us. Um, some of them are even calling and recommend sending clients to us that don't that aren't our clients, but they're from the Philippines, and they showed up at their door, and they said, hey, can you help them? They need to get their electricity on, electricity turned on, and we want to rent to them. 
that didn't ring to them before, but they are now. Owensboro is becoming the place that I think everybody in this room wants it to be, a place that welcomes people from all different shapes, backgrounds, all colors, all creeds. And that makes me very excited. And that's why I'm still in this job that I never thought I'd ever have. <laughs> that's why I'm still here. So, um, so we, we get through that process. They remain our active clients for about a year. And then they, they remain clients of ours that we continue to help for up to five years. So that's kind of the process of the intake and what we do. The funding only lasts for about a year. But we've tried hard on, on the backside to raise money privately through individual donations and churches to have money set aside for those extra things and those people who need a bit more help along the way. So we'll continue to do that as much as we can. I know I'm committed to that. Um, so if I ever call you and ask you for a check, just know it's not for myself. It's certainly going to be put to good use because there are some of those clients that just need a little bit longer. A year just isn't quite enough. And so we, the federal government won't approve that, but we're determined to, to make that happen and, and help as long as we can. So I don't know how I'm doing on time. I can keep going for... I think you're fine for right and now. And still good? We'll, we'll let you have the mic again. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you, Diane. Um, I understand Thomas is volunteer with a different organization called Refugees International, and he's going to talk a little bit about what, what he's been doing uh, in um, helping folks with language. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to the AAUW and the campus and the rest of the panel and you know, everybody here in the audience for showing up. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, real quick, before I get into you know what we're here for tonight, kind of my story really begins um, years ago when I was deployed to Afghanistan. I did two tours, um, 2012, 2014. And, you know, if I was to be honest, I, I came home in a negative headspace, unfortunately, um, towards that land, if you will. But in the subsequent years, God really changed my hardened heart and really flipped it upside down. Uh, so early last year, my wife and I uh, decided to become volunteers for an organization called Refuge International. And we started helping, you know, refugees from different parts of the world, whatever they needed, and primarily with English tutoring. That's always like a constant need. Uh, if you're from a different land, you come here, English is just a hot priority. Um, so we started out helping people from other nations, but you know, in our hearts, we, we really had a, a, a place for people from Afghanistan, particularly because that's a land that I've seen and I've, I've been there. So we all saw it on the TV, Afghanistan was collapsing and it was you know, hard to watch, very unfortunate to watch, a very sad time. Um, but my wife and I were thinking, what if they come to Owensboro? You know, it's, it's a strange thought, but what if people from that part of the world come here? And then, of course, in the subsequent weeks, next month or two, we heard, yes, they are coming here. There are going to be some coming here. Uh, so my wife and I and, and you know, other volunteers, you know, we committed to say, we're going to help. Um, and then they arrived and for me something that that really drove me then and still now and into the future Jesus instructs us in Mark 12 31 to love our neighbor as ourself so that's that I really took that really personal and really you know wrap my arms around it and, and these these refugees no matter the country they come from but they're now our neighbors and we're instructed we got to love them because that's what I would want. If I had to get uprooted and moved somewhere else, I would want somebody to, to come around me and help me out. Uh, so as it's already been mentioned a little bit, the, the hotel happened, the, the comfort suites, and uh, we were led and just walked in. And I remember very um, clearly uh, we met Nancy uh, that first night, and we just said, hey, we're just here to help. We, we don't want to step on any toes or get outside of our lane or anything. We're just an extra pair of hands. You know, is there something that we can do, something we can help with? Um, and as Diane mentioned, that International Center was busy doing 
housing and getting you know identification cards and all these things so really kind of the niche we filled in was going to the hotel at least twice a week and we would just do like some informal English classes uh, English as a second language kind of style uh, beginners women and children beginners men advanced um, English for men things of that nature so we did that for a few months and really through that we started building a lot of relationships with individuals so as people started leaving the hotel and going to their home uh, you know we asked hey do you want us to, to still meet with you one-on-one -on -one in your home and everyone said yes you know so our volunteers I know volunteers from other organizations uh, but you know we go to people's homes and we we started just teaching them more English not in a way that's in lieu of any official curriculum or anything like that but just as a supplement you know sometimes people call it like survivor English you know, what are the colors what are the days of the week what's how do I describe where I'm at in the city if I'm lost you know things like that that way they can get around day to day um, so the hotel days and then their homes and we started picking up on other needs you know America there's so many things that we don't even know that we do that it doesn't really have to be taught to us things like checking the mailbox every day things like understanding how to set up your voicemail how to properly call into work if there's an issue just all those types of like really little things that we just typically naturally know how to do teaching someone how to do all those types of things so sometimes we're teaching English sometimes we were you know teaching this is how the post office works uh, things like that and we got questions about you know the workplace things like that and then we started transitioning into also teaching people how to drive that was something that spring early summer a lot of folks said hey I want to start getting my permit so you know me and several other volunteers work with folks teaching them how to drive and you know there's a difference in knowing how to operate a vehicle and following like the million <laughs> rules that we have <laughs> in America so um, that was a fun experience and it was it's not just teaching them how to pass the road test but really how to drive because you can teach them 15 different things that they'll pass the road test but this situation this is what you should be doing and then when it's raining out this is how you should handle it and um, through all that I think I actually became a better driver my, <laughs> my wife or maybe my parents they might disagree with that uh, and they could be right but you know I myself I became a better driver through that um, the English is still ongoing and that's always going to be a long-term need so kind of looking at now and into the future you know what are some practical ways that anybody can help the English is always going to be uh, high on that list I, I would say a lot of the men they've been working this year so they've picked up a lot of conversational skills and things like that but the women you know there's really a, a, a need for more women to understand how to speak English and we have volunteers that are working with women um, I know other organizations have that too but there's still there's a lot of moms out there that still need to learn how to, to speak English so that they can communicate with the school for their for their kid and all those types of things so whether it's you're committing an hour a week two hours a week but there's there's ways uh, just helping someone learn English and uh, it's as easy as just talking with them and, and teaching them the letters and all that it's because uh, we know how to speak English so we can we can teach somebody uh, it, it's very doable uh, another tangible need here in the future I, I suspect that a lot of the women are going to want to learn how to drive so but in their home country, and this could be the case beyond Afghanistan, but they probably didn't know how to drive in their home country. Maybe it was illegal for them to do so. Maybe they just weren't afforded the opportunity, things of that nature. But, you know, the moms, they're, they're going to want to be able to pick their kid up from school one day. They're going to want to do those types of things, and, and, and they should be able to. Uh, so that's another tangible need. Teaching, teaching the women how to drive uh, and even I would say I think a lot of the women want to work one day um, not many of them are employed right now is my understanding um, but 
they're going to want to be one day. They're, they're going to want to work. Uh, so how, you know, just, just walking them through that, teaching them whatever they need to know, and that starts with English and driving a lot of times. Um, another, another tangible way is after school training or assistance. You know, these, these high school, middle school students, you know, they're coming home and they have homework issues or they don't understand the subject matter. You know, maybe maybe people can come alongside a family and say, hey, I'll help out your, your middle schooler twice a week with their homework or things like that. Uh, the very tangible need, something that's very... Because, we, you know, we want the, the children to grow up and take full advantage of the opportunities that America has for them. So homework help, after school help. And then one other thing I'm kind of thinking of for the future is GEDs. Uh, a lot of people... There are some educated refugees, absolutely. There, there's there's some that have more education than I do, uh, by a long shot. But many didn't, they weren't afforded the opportunity uh, to go to school. So they, to get, you know, like Diane and others were mentioning, long term for their professional growth, you know, they're, they're going to need to get GEDs for a lot of jobs. You know, they have the skills, they either have the English now or they will soon. But they got to check that block on an application that they have some type of high school equivalency. So that's something that, you know, can be kind of chewed on for a while. But that's that's something in the future, a couple years down the road, if not sooner. And then I'd say lastly, being a friend. I mean, the, the value of being a friend, of having a friend that cares and loves for you and is there for you cannot be overstated. Um, so all these other things... Serving others, they're, they're great and wonderful and needed, but being a friend is, is potentially one of the highest priorities, one of the highest needs. Somebody that they can go to, hey, I think I need to go to the hospital, can you come with me tonight? Um, hey, I'm in this other city, I'm going to buy this car, I think, can you like check it out on video, you know, like FaceTime or whatever, you know, just things like that in life, you know, just being that go-to person that they trust and um, you know, they, they know that you have their best interest in mind. So, um, but yeah, that's about all I have. So again, I uh, appreciate everybody for coming out tonight. Thanks, Thomas. <clears throat> um, Nancy Bradshaw. I was afraid I'd wandered into the wrong meeting. Of, I can't teach English because even the good English speakers are befuddled by this accent. So I wasn't part of the hotel group. Um, what I did want to talk about, though, which Tom alluded to, was volunteerism. And um, we need lots and lots of help. And I've been at the International Center enough to take calls of people who want to help. And are frustrated because no one gets back to them. And that doesn't mean we don't need you. So let me just mention briefly how and why I got involved. Um, my husband's a Middle East, he's here, he's a Middle East historian. We've traveled in the Middle East. In fact, his master's thesis was on Afghanistan. So we, you know, he knows a little bit about that. And I just thought we should get involved. Uh, 50 years ago, we were strangers in a strange land. We were in the Peace Corps, found ourselves plopped down in a village in India, and I know how these folks feel. <laughs> they can't speak the language and the food is strange. Anyway, I ended up uh, volunteering and I wanted to kind of suggest ways some of you could help if you want to get involved. Uh, I'm a person who basically asked for forgiveness instead of permission. And when it came time to be a mentor, I was supposed to do a police check and fingerprint and all that. I said, nah, don't have time to wait. So I just got involved with the family and I'm still working with them. They don't need me much anymore. I used to take them to the grocery store every week. Now they have a car. Um, I take mama to English class twice a week. And frankly, beyond that, they don't really need me. I'm hoping she'll get a driver's license soon and can uh, take care of herself. Anyway, um, I went to a meet. I went. I dropped by the International Center. This was before Diane was there, <clears throat> and just said, "What can I do? I need to volunteer to help." 
And she said, we're having a big meeting. Everyone's going to come. I went to that meeting. I met Diane Bowers, who heads a team from First Presbyterian Church who sets up housing, uh, takes the beds and all that for people. Um, as it turns out, I got put on that committee because we have a truck. <laughs> <laughs> My husband says, are we the only ones in town with a truck? <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's, it was wonderful. The very first two guys uh, who from Afghanistan, not the young couple, but two guys, we set up their apartment. And then we just kind of go back and check on them. You know, how did it work? What do you need? Um, give them a heavier blanket or whatever. Well, in the meantime, I've got to get all those items donated. And a lot of you all have just been terrific helping with that, spreading the word. I have a, friends from church. I call them the usual suspects. I'll send out a Facebook thing and say, I need coffee tables. You know, I need them yesterday. And they spread the word and things show up. Janet Luckett at First Christian scrounges like you wouldn't believe. We get things. Just tonight, she said, I've got a washing machine for you. So that's what it takes. <laughs> lots and lots of volunteers and don donors. There's a slight problem. I've got the truck, but what I also have is an old, weak back. <laughs> I'm an old lady. I can't lift heavy things. Um, I used to use the refugee guys. I'd pick them up, and they'd, they could pile things. You wouldn't. That's a whole other story. But they would help so much moving furniture around. Well, they're all working now, which is a good thing. So I'm always needing strong bags. I need people call and say, I've got a table and chairs. Can you come get it? And got the truck, but then what? You know. So we really need help with that. The fellows at First Presbyterian set up washers and dryers. They're almost as old as I am. They, we need some young guys who are willing to come and available to help move furniture and pick up donations and deliver things. So if you know people who want to get involved, you don't have to be hand thumbprinted or anything. We can, we, can, we can put you to work without. Laura didn't hear that. She's in charge of being sure we're all official. But, I did it for a year without that. So uh, Amy Beck, my friend here, is a mentor. And I just, I gave her a family. I don't think I'm allowed to do that. But <laughs> she wanted to help. <laughs> she wanted to help. And I said, well, how about this mama? And her, she, she met them. She's been helping them ever since. It's not just financial help. Um, we don't, I don't spend much money on my family that I adopted. It's like Tom said, just being there, driving them when they need it, getting to know their little kids. There's just so much you can do as a mentor that doesn't require a lot. Uh, we have the, you know, the, young, the African family that lost the son recently. Such a tragic story. From the first, they had a mentor, a husband and wife who adopted that family. <clears throat> and I remember when the boy passed, I thought how grateful I was that there was someone from our side, besides Diane and her crew who were just stretched to the limit, who knew them and could go and, and be there for them. So the mentor program is it's wonderful. And I think you'd love it if you got involved. Uh, driving people, I mean, that's a nightmare picking them up for doctor's appointments. I have two car seats in my car right now. My children never even had a car seat. That's how old I am. The little things that hung over the car with a little fake steering wheel, better to decapitate them with. I don't even know how to install it, but they're in the car, mama puts them in. And so you can make that work, being a mentor and helping. Uh, we need donations. We need furniture, we need dishes. We need bedding. Uh, it's not like it was with 180 all arrived at one time, but uh, we welcome donations. And people, I just can't tell you how generous this community has been. I mean, just, I get calls every day, you know. Sometimes I, I get calls every day. Uh, today I picked up a sofa and took it directly to a young couple who, who needed it. So anyway, volunteer, get involved. Call the center. If you don't get a call back, do it anyway. You know, come by. Find some way you can help by donating. Money is always nice. And I'm not asking you all. I'm 
<clears throat> assuming that you're taking this word out to someone else. And just, if they say, what can I do? First of all, tell them no clothes to me. I don't want any clothes ever again, because that's how I got started. There were bags of clothes coming out the front door of the International Center, and we just picked up that first bag and started emptying it and learned a lot about that. You know, you don't want teeny tiny clothes or great big clothes. You don't want dirty T-shirts with guns or beer drinkers make better lovers. On them. You, know, you, just, you have to, you know, that was a huge job. So there, there, there are plenty of, plenty of opportunities to help. So if people you know ask how you can help, be persistent, call the center because we really do need you. Let me mention one other thing that you all could help with because you know other people. I have found that I kind of know what's an interesting story. When I first heard about, was it Pleasant Grove Baptist Church provided over 100 backpacks filled with personal care items. I just thought, that's a story. You know, I called the messenger inquirer. I'm pretty pushy like that. Well, they sent a reporter, and they did a nice story on that. Um, well, we got 100 prayer rugs from some ladies in Indiana. I thought, someone needs to know about that. I just emailed the editor. I don't know him, but he sent a reporter. So you could help spread the word for things like that. I have a friend who, uh, her daughter-in-law writes for the New York Times, and I follow her on Twitter, and I one time just messaged her and said, why don't you come to Owensboro and see what's going on with these Afghani refugees? And she wrote back, <laughs> and she said, I'll put you through to the immigration desk. And the lady called. I hooked her up with Diane. They talked for, what, an hour or one night? She came to Owensboro who wrote an article about our refugees here. So help with that. Spread the good word when you hear of something good that's happened. Uh, call the newspaper, such as it is. Uh, there's, maybe maybe they covered this meeting. That was good. So um, Anyway, that's, I'm just pushing here for help. We need volunteers. We need them in a lot of areas. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nancy. I, 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 I had some empathy there for what you were saying. I've done a lot of disaster work over the years, and one of the things we talk about is the disaster after the disaster, and that's when the clothes show up. <laughs> and you don't know what to do with, with all that and where you're going to get rid of them <laughs> politely. Um, fourth on our agenda this evening is Bruce Coons, and I'm going to ask him to step up and chat with us for a little bit. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And before I even start, Thomas, I want to thank you for your service. So I, I can't imagine what, uh, what what he went through, but it turned out that uh, you were led in a special way to have an impact here in our local community. So Absolutely. we should be thankful for that. Uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of anecdotal uh, information stories. I got involved um, in November of last year when I was on vacation and Miss Diane called me and said, we've got a family from Afghanistan coming in. We have no place for them to stay. So my wife's family had uh, three small farms in the Utica area. And on one of those farms, we have a log cabin with an addition on it, which family stays in from time to time when they're in town. So she said, do you think this family could stay out there? So I said, we don't care, but it's a small place. It was a family with seven kids wow. and two adults, uh, and they were happy to be there. Uh, we got to know the family quite well, and uh, they're doing amazingly well now, I think, uh, because of the support that, that we've given them. But I provided a lot of transportation for them early on, running back and forth to town, going to the grocery um, doctor's appointments, whatever Diane told me to do, basically, <laughs> I, I was there to help out. Uh, after four months in this cabin with all of them basically sleeping in one room, they were able to find, we, they found a home for them. 
so they've got a, a nice home now uh, in town and and they're doing well the kids are in school daughter the oldest daughter's working the father's working uh, they're learning English they have a car a friend of mine had a car they wanted to sell very nice vehicle we sold to them at a reduced price uh, so they were thrilled with that uh, somebody talked about driving earlier they drive differently in, in Kabul than they do in Owensboro. <laughs> and uh, they have a habit of driving very fast and stopping very quickly right behind the vehicle in front of them. <laughs> I'm not going to relate the other story about my sister's car that we loaned to one of them, but anyway. Uh, it's, it's been a great experience for me. Uh, like Nancy, I had an opportunity to live abroad many, many years ago in South America. And so I know what it's like to be in a country where you don't speak the English well, or you don't speak the language well, excuse me. Uh, the customs are different. And so you learn to have empathy for people who are in situations like, like the Afghanistan refugees are. But it's really difficult to think about how I would have had to leave my country forever knowing I could not go back. Because if I did, I'd be killed or imprisoned. Uh, the family that we helped that was in this cabin, the father was a security guard at the American Embassy. So there was no way he, could, he would be able to go back. So these people have stories that are, in some cases, very tragic. In some cases, they're very uplifting. But they all have stories, and, the, and they all need friends, and they all need help. And, and our community has just been wonderful in providing that for them. The other thing I can tell you a little bit about, I'm on the uh, board of the community dental clinic, and early on we found out that there are a lot of unmet dental needs in these folks. Their dental hygiene is very poor in many cases. We wound up pulling a lot of teeth uh, in a very few days. Uh, some of the folks weren't real happy about having their teeth pulled, but there was really nothing else could be done. Some of them were in such bad shape. Since then, we've had uh, two days where we br brought them in for dental screening. One of them was just recently, in end of September, I guess. And now we have a new dentist at the dental clinic, and we're able to work these Afghans in. I think Diane's providing a list of the ones that really need help quickly. And so we're able to, to really bring those folks in and kind of bring them into the system so that they'll have regular dental care and they'll know where they can turn if they have problems. So that's been especially rewarding to see the way that, that we can help them. And that's about all I've got. We'll be happy to answer questions later. I hope everyone here also realizes all that Diane Ford has done with the International Center. It's, it's amazing the effort and the time that she's devoted to this. So I hope everybody will thank her for that. Okay. We're going to have Laura Jones as our next presenter. Thank you so much. I'm the Youth and Family Services Coordinator at the International Center. And for any of you all that have not been involved in the past, I would encourage you to come out, meet our crew, and let us introduce you to some of these wonderful folks that have joined our community. Um, before I came to the International Center, I was a family case manager for the Department of Child Services and an assessment manager at that. Um, so I came from a very rewarding job but not one that was very happy and I can't tell you how amazing it is for me personally uh, to just get to see these folks grow through mentorship through what Diane and the rest of the folks in our office do um, something as simple as just like learning how to use their washing machine um, learning that they can open the garage with a button that's the most exciting thing ever for some of them uh, just little things like that that is aha moments they're just great so um, with the youth mentoring program um, we focus on youth from the age of 15 to 24 um, in areas of educational and vocational development um, we look at self-sufficiency teaching them life skills looking at their emotional and health and wellness um, things like that and really just helping them integrate and learn about their community um, we do a lot of different things I pair mentees and mentors together and we try to do so very mindfully all of our refugees come in at different levels of skill, um, like um, 
Thomas said some of them might already know a lot of English. Some of them might not know any. Um, and so that's the one factor I think a lot of people are really intimidated by when coming in. But I'll just tell you, like, they love engaging with Americans. You will learn just as much from them as they will from you. And it really is fun to learn how to communicate with one another. You really learn a lot about nonverbal communication and just what your similarities are at the human base. <laughs> so um, some of our needs right now, of course, definitely mentors because of that inhibition and you know being scared to to join up we have several different teams right now who are waiting for mentors um those individuals participate in monthly group activities that we coordinate at the international center um i've had the opportunity to do a lot of really fun things with our teens we um, have gone on college visits this summer we got to do a summer arts therapy camp with them down at the fine arts or sorry science and history museum and then we did a fine arts tour we have some very talented students in this town i, I can't tell you i mean it's it's very impressive what they can do um, we help them with tutoring and ESL, we are in the process with Lindsay um, and some other educators in um, coordinating Monday ESL nights. And um, so the purpose of that, because um, for our students, they, they don't go to regular ESL classes like what the adults do. They get welcome classes at their school, um, but a lot of times they kind of sometimes miss things in the process of that because they're so thankful they won't speak up and tell you what's wrong most of the time. Um, so. Our goal with this is to be able to have a one-on-one -on -one approach to really help them strengthen their conversational English and also help with peer-to-peer -peer tutoring for those individuals. So if you are an educator in any way, fashion, or form, or if you just want to be a warm body to come look after some younger siblings, um, come on out and get a hold of me. Um, unfortunately, and like Nancy said, like for our younger teens, we do have to have a background check, but... Um, if you want, we can get you involved in any way. So um, we've also gotten to do like career and vocational training. Um, our career center has been wonderful in partnering with us and helping both our youth and our adults. Um, they've been able to help one of our uh, Congolese students with who actually came over here and due to trauma um, was deaf and so something that we learned in the process of this is that she spoke sign language, but Swahili sign language. <laughs> so it's been a learning process for everyone through that. Um, if you come and you meet Camille, um, she handles our preferred communities program. She's done so much with this particular client. Um, you'll see over here we've got lots of different paperwork and things like that. I wanted to go over just a few things that we need. This one in particular has got our general volunteer needs and then also the youth mentor program needs. Like I already said, we really need mentors. Um, transportation is always a huge need. It's a huge turtle. My prayer is that eventually we'll have a lot more public transportation opportunities for our clients. But until that time, those warm bodies that come in and volunteer, I usually have about 10, 15 people that I call and text regularly and they are so kind to come out and pick kids up at their homes and bring them in. I will forewarn you, time is also another thing that we have a lot of trouble teaching people. So you might get to the door and they might be in a towel. So, um, but that's just something we have to, you know, understand and teach. A lot of other cultures are not like America. They're more socially oriented. So, you know, it's about personal interaction and if so, someone, an elder comes in, they're not gonna leave until they're dismissed to go to their appointments. Um, also, we need assistance with like field trips and chaperones, things like that, and just general um, supplies and donations. Um, my goal is to be able to present incentives for our youth who want to participate in that mentor program. It's a six month program commitment. Um, so they meet with a mentor for one and a half to two hours a week. Um, whenever they first come into the program, we set them up with a goal plan. Um, sometimes it's really challenging to get them to think about what they really want to do. Much like our adults, they're like, I don't know what I can do or I don't know what I want to do. So we, um, we try to really motivate them and empower them to come up with some things there. Um, and then we do check-ins each month. Um, we've got one particular family um, that their oldest son is involved in our mentoring program. And I can't tell you how far this child has come in learning English. It is so impressive. 
he's been here four months, maybe three, four months. They were uh, really one of the first families that I met whenever I came on to the International Center. And he will actually come in and say, hi, Miss Laura, how are you? And, you know, really express himself. And he knew nothing to begin with. Um, so that's kind of the gist of the Youth Mentor Program. Um, we do have an activity coming up. I'll use this time to plug real quick. Um, we are going to be doing on November the 29th, it's uh, the Giving Tuesday. We're going to actually be doing a, um, a random acts of kindness scavenger hunt called Thanks is for Giving. So I'm looking for volunteers to come on board to um, help our youth go out into the community and do random acts of kindness. One priority I have is teaching them that they have something to offer and something to give. And learning that through service is so rewarding for them. It's very empowering. Um, so we need people for that. We'll end up the night with um, doing a Friendsgiving meal. And so whatever capacity you might like to volunteer about, it's a good opportunity to get to meet some of our youth, our staff, and other volunteers. So thank you all so much. Um, I've turned the first group of questions uh, back over to Diane because they all seem to be some general kinds of questions about the program and about the community, not specific things. So let me let her get back up here. Part of why we're having everybody come up to the, up to the podium is that the mic for the video is up here, so we can't just pass the mic around. So thank you for being patient. Thank you all for being willing to get up. Okay, I, I'm going to start off by just letting everyone know if we haven't already that the volunteer packets and information up here will tell you exactly what our um, needs are at the moment from a donation perspective, from a volunteer perspective. So. We'd love for you to pick one up before you leave. It'll tell you exactly what we need. ESL volunteers, what days and times, mentors, all those things are listed right there in that packet. So Laura was right. She needs a, a background check for some of the programs that she does. But Nancy was also right that we can put anybody to work if you're not so inclined to give us a background check. So don't be hesitant because I also spent seven days a week at that hotel with those refugees and I never had a background check. So full disclosure. So, um, okay, I'm gonna go through these as quickly as I can. Uh, first one, how many of the 182 ref Afghan refugees came here knowing English? Um, at the time when we were in the hotel, we had about 25 at the time that knew fluent English. So I would say that's a little over 30 now. But we continue to get more Afghans. We actually had a young couple that called me the other day from Evansville, and they were resettled there a few months ago, but they're not receiving very many services. I was so impressed by the woman, the wife. Uh, they have an 11-month-old son. And she just, she was complimentary of the programming and the support that we've offered, especially for women here. And so she asked if I would transfer their case. And I said, yes, I actually happen to have a house that's next to another Afghan family, so it works out perfectly. Later, I come to find out that she was the first female Afghan fighter pilot in Afghanistan. So I could tell she was very smart, but apparently, um, She's really smart. <laughs> so she came here. She, that she wants to. They're not here yet, but I'm working on it and getting that housing stuff all situated. But um, for, for whatever she knows, she felt like the support that we've offered was something that she was, and she wanted to be a part of it. She said, I'd love to help you strengthen that. So, um, so I would say about 30 of those that knew, knew fluent English um, when they came. How many worked for the US government? This is just a guess for me, but you know we had a spreadsheet that a few of the translators helped me build with all that demographic stuff, their past employment, down to the shirt size that they wore. We knew everything about these people. Um, and I would say 90% of them that were employed in some capacity served our government, whether it was through the embassy, through the military, whether they were a baker, you know, for a, at one of the bases, they in some capacity probably 80 to 90 percent. 
Um, interpreters. Yeah, interpreters, um, soldiers, IT. They ran the IT for the embassy and the military. I mean, a whole host of things. Um, how many refugees come to Owensboro annually and who decides? So we, we get our IOM is who decides the travel for normal refugees. Now, Afghan refugees were different, right? Um, but the current administration, so the president, decides how many refugees the United States will take every year. He sets that threshold, that capacity. And then the U.S. State Department, along with IOM, they make those decisions as far as who's coming and when. But the administration decides how many and from what areas will be the primary focus and which areas we'll, we will be accepting. So that's when I said um, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Africa, and Rohingya. That's the best guess based on the conflict that's going on in the world and based on what the administration is telling the State Department and they are telling us. Um, will we be getting some from the border illegal? We may, but we don't have any indication of that. We don't have anything to do. We can only serve the International Center. Re resettlement agencies can only serve humanitarian parolees, refugees, um, asylum seekers. So we were not technically allowed to help anybody with funding or it's not a billable allowance for us. Does that make any sense? So if somebody were to come in and need us to help them with a utility bill, we can do that, but we cannot like set up their, not pay for it, but set up their, their electricity bill. Or if we want to do that, we can, but we're not allowed to enroll them in programming. We're not allowed to use our work time for that reason. So we can only serve those three categories. Um, why aren't we getting more from Ukraine now than other countries where we already have so many? In order for Ukrainians to come, they have to have a, a U.S. sponsor, a TAI. So that program is entirely different. They, too, were deemed humanitarian parolees. But they have to have a U.S. sponsor that basically says that they are taking the responsibility for that person or that family and that they are going to help them with housing and finances. And so they have to have a tie, a sponsor, to get here. Does that answer your question, I hope? So that's why it's all dependent upon how many sponsors we have that accept Ukrainians. Um, what is our annual budget? It changes year to year depending upon what the Office of Refugee Resettlement gives us in each program. So it's really hard to answer that question. Like, for instance, the RMP program, they have just increased our allotment. So every client gets $1,275 when they come. That's what our clients call their welcome money. So that's what we use to, to help them set up their houses, to help them set up their utilities. Um, anything that's left over, if there's a little bit of cash left over, we can give that to them in the end, but normally there's hardly anything left, but it's $1,275 per client. Um, from there, um, paying the rent and utilities, it's all based on the number of slots that we have. So it's hard to really tell you what our annual budget is because it's all dependent upon each quarter and how, what our enrollment is. And in each program gives us a, a different amount of money. Um, and then I'll say this, I, with each client, we get a, a little bit of admin money per client. And that's what pays our salaries um, and helps us pay our utilities and our, um, if we have, you know, for our, for our office, it pays for um, any sort of admin expenses. We get a little bit per client to take care of that as well. Um, so we're a fully funded program from that perspective, our clients. So we don't, a lot of people say, why don't you do more fundraising? And we do fundraising when we need to, but we are very fortunate in the fact that the federal government supports the refugee resettlement process in the way that they do. And so we only, we only solicit funding when we have special projects. 
like when Laura wanted to do her art camp, which was phenomenal. I don't know if any of you all follow our Facebook page, but what she did with those kids was incredible. Um, they had a fantastic time. They made wonderful relationships. And, uh, and we built a lot of great new community partners in the process, which is what we have to do in order to support these families. So she's doing a really great job, and I hope you'll have a chance to talk to her. Um, how many refugees can we expect on an annual basis? That also fluctuates, but we set our capacity this year at 175, more than we've ever set before. Um, typically, on average, I think the International Center was resettling about 40 per year until the Afghans came. And um, I think they discovered that we could do it. <laughs> I guess. So we're now set at. Oh, well, yeah. So um, it's our capacity for fiscal year 23 is 175, and I think we can do it. Um, you asked me to speak about housing. I didn't do that so much, but I touched on it for a moment. The, the barrier in Owensboro, well, my husband um, is involved in the community as well, and he really helped me when it was time to do housing for the Afghans. They were in the hotel. They had no nowhere to go. People were not willing to rent to our clients for a multitude of reasons. One, there's a stigma that we're, I'm not gonna pretend is not there. Two, there are a couple of misconceptions. One being that you can only put two people per one bedroom and that it's a HUD rule. It's a HUD regulation that you have to follow. Well, it isn't unless you're a Section 8 or subsidized housing um, property. And three, that you have to have a Social Security number to rent to someone. That's also a misconception. There's no federal law or state law demanding that. So we sat down and Clay and I, Clay, my husband, and said, all right, well, what do we need to do? Well, we need to tell them that they're wrong but I've been telling them that they're wrong and they're not listening. So, so let's put together a legal document. Let's go to the Kentucky Housing Authority. We sat down with Susan Gesser. We, we went, we met with several people in the community and we put together a letter explaining it, saying, this is, this is okay, you can trust this process. So that was a, a one big step forward. The second big step was putting together a little bit of, of money in an account to say to the property owner, there's some hesitancy there on their end. They said, how do we know that they're going to stay? How do we know that they're going to stay here and they're going to be able to pay their rent? You say that they have to get a job within 90 days because they do. Within our programs, all of them, they have to work. But how can we trust that? So we said, all right. We had a generous church, and I don't know if they want to be named, but one of the, gen one of the many that said, okay, we've got this money we want to do something with. And so I said, well, can we just set it aside in this account just as like a, a backup, okay? And, and if anybody skips out on their rent, we'll use it to pay. How about that? And it was a, it was a considerable amount of money. So we did that. And, and I said, we said, we'll pay three months rent in advance. So why can't we do that? We already have their funding, right? We already know how much money they're going to get. So what if I just go ahead and pay you three months in advance? Who else can do that? Who else can guarantee that we'll pay for 12 months and we'll go ahead and pay you three months in advance? And by the way, all the stuff that you're worried about over here is not actually legal or factual. And then all of a sudden, well, you'll pay three months in advance? Oh, and, and you'll pay if they skip out on the rent? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everybody... And now, though, nobody even asks that question. They don't. They know it's a process they can trust. They, they've gotten to know the tenants, that they're wonderful people who are here, that are so similar to you and I. Our differences are not that, that great. We're more similar than, than we are different. And anyways, it's, a it's a, been a beautiful thing. It took us a while to get there. So there we were in the hotel. So that was a little bit, that's a little bit about the housing why it was a problem before and why we're, we're there now. And I feel comfortable saying that we can resettle 175 and I think we can do it within 12 months. If we did it in three to four months, I think we can do it in 12. Um, this is one thing I'm sorry I didn't touch on before, how will Afghan parolees transition to citizenship? So um, they are going through the asylum process right now. 
They all have to apply for asylum within 12 months of arrival into the United States. That's different than our normal refugees who have permanent residency here. Our Afghans do not. It's very unfortunate that we brought them all here and then we make them fight for their right to stay because that's what they're doing. And actually right now, um, one thing that we did and that I was felt really, I'm very blessed and feel lucky that we were able to do it. We raised a little bit of money to hire one of the Afghans who was a journalist in Afghanistan who speaks Dari and Pashto and English and Urdu. He speaks all four languages fluently. Someone said he's like a unicorn, and I do think he probably is. And he's here with his wife and two children, and we hired him to be the Afghan liaison. And he works seven days a week. He helps with doctor's appointments, school enrollments, DMV. Laura can attest to this. He works. He does everything. <laughs> if he wasn't here, they would not be settled. And right now he's in Chicago translating because he's the only asylum-approved Dari Pashto English-speaking interpreter between our office and Bowling Green. So he's helping do that. because you. No, it's Idris. It's Idris. Haibar works for Catholic Charities, but he doesn't speak Pashto. So Idris is the only one, and his asylum got approved. So we kind of, we got his filled out quickly because we knew this would be an issue. So you have to have an asylum approved interpreter and you have to, they, you have to take them with you. So, which is kind of a, it wasn't like that in the beginning. USCIS said you could have an interpreter over the phone. Well, now they make you take them to Chicago. So we have to transport them there. So think about that, families of nine, every single family member has to go. And it's a two day stint. So one day we had 23 people to transport to Chicago. It's, it's a logistical nightmare basically. But that's what they're doing right now. And they all have to get through that. And some of them have been denied and they then appeal. Um, but it's really unfortunate. So um, the Afghan Adjustment Act, if anyone is familiar, if you're so inclined to write your congressman and, and ask them to support it, it would allow our Afghans to stay without having to go through this process. And I believe that they deserve that, that, that we've brought them here and just the idea of making them worry about having to go back. Um, I could tell you so many stories of what's happening to their family members um, that I hear on a weekly basis that makes me so sad and I can't do anything for them. But if they go back, their lives are at risk and we know that. So in my opinion, they need to be able to stay. So that I think answers all of the questions. <laughs> Unless you have more I'll for find me. Some more. Okay, I'm sure okay. Let me give you a break though for a minute or sure. two. Some of these are, I think, short questions that um, I'm going to ask, and I'll repeat for the recording the answer. Uh, they're too short to have people come up and go sit down again. Uh, they're kind of yes and no kinds of ones. Um, are the children able to go to school if they don't speak English? Yes. So what our process is that we actually do school enrollments. We have very great collaborative relationships with the school districts here. And we set up orientations for them. Like I said, they have welcome classes for them. So. And honestly, the kids are like sponges. They learn English faster than the parents do, 90% of the time. I think this is for Nancy. Is there a physical warehouse? Is there some place people can go donate materials, I think, is what's being asked? Uh, yes, we have a wonderful warehouse that was donated by a very generous citizen. It's a mess right now, but... Uh, Again, if we can get people to come there and drop things off, that's very helpful. During the big peak, I was there every day and had set hours. I'm not doing that now, but we may do that again if we get a big influx. So yes, if, so if somebody had something they specifically wanted to donate, they should call the center? Either the center will give them my phone number. Exactly. And I get calls all the time. It's wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
On the topics of phones, and I may have mentioned about us not pulling back, our phones are really jacked up and we're in the process of rectifying that. So my card's right over there too, and I'm sure Diane's probably got one of hers on her. Um, if you all call either of our cell phones, we're happy to get back anytime. So. Laura, I think this would be for you too. What level of support's available through the school resource office? Well, the schools have been, like I said, they've been amazing. Um, whenever that we go through those school orientations, usually we introduce the kids and families to the resource officers. Generally, they'll let them know that they can help with health referrals, they can help them with supplies, they can help with food if they need it, lots of different things, social and emotional wellness supports, just about anything we can ask for. They're fantastic. Okay. Um... This question is probably for Diane. Are any unions involved with training and job placement? No, we do not have any relationships currently with unions. Okay. Um, this is a question by from someone about getting after-hours English lessons for a particular person. And I'm going to just hand this to Diane. And if whoever question raised that question would see or give her a call, that would probably be the best way to handle that. Where did the majority of the Afghan refugees end up living? In apartments, homes, or mobile homes? No mobile homes. Um, no mobile homes. No mobile homes. We probably have a, more homes than apartments. More homes and apartments. All within the city limits. An individual wants to know if there are any, any similar programs to this in Alabama. Yes, there are resettlement agencies in Alabama. Okay, and they would, if they were interested, they could check with you about. Yes, I can look the, that. Where look that. Wouldn't know off the top of your head, I don't but know could, off yeah. Top of my head, but I do know there are some. Okay. In That's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't have to read. You don't want me to read their end. All right. <laughs> They've all been asked, right? They've all been answered. Been wonderful answers. Okay. Um, this was a. This is kind of a suggestion for Nancy. It was, have you contacted fraternities at Kentucky Wesleyan or social work classes at Brescia for occasional furniture moving? This would be a good service project for them. Yes, so. I have had uh, help from Wesleyan. Uh, the music director at First Presbyterian was sponsoring a class there, and they were very helpful. I would call and I was at a sale and I had some furniture and they came right over and helped. So I, I am aware of that as a possibility. Those but thanks for the reminder. Young, young, healthy, yeah. <laughs> healthy, <laughs> strong people. Um, I'm, I'm going to field this back to, uh, to Diane. And there are two questions on here is, um, oh, one was, does anybody coordinate transportation? Yes, we do. So <laughs> there, you, if, if you were willing to volunteer, you could call the center. Yes, and somebody that coordinates transportation. Okay, terrific. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn this back to you, and the question there, too, is I wanted you to talk a little bit about what the case management program was since okay. Sky couldn't be here tonight. Okay. The other question is what do people do to help if they aren't able to commit a great deal of time, okay. what could they do? Okay. Uh, so to touch on the case management, what Sky does, Sky does the reception and placement program. So um, all of our <clears throat> caseworkers do case management. So Sky okay. is reception and placement, that first 90-day window, that first welcome program basically so we receive and place them and so that's what she does so when we then transition them to the next program whether it's match grant or rca we sky continues to be a support system for them so we also we take the approach that just because they leave her program they don't leave her if that makes sense. She'll always be a contact, but now they have this next case manager who's, uh, whether it's Camille in preferred communities, and that's a, 
that's a special mm-hmm. program that they can have dual enrollment in that and let's say match grant if they have um, an intense situation, a medical a medical issue or a disability or something, uh, they can be enrolled in her program and in match grant or in RCA. So all of our caseworkers do case management. Uh, we have family case management. We have um, the RCA program, match grant, PC, all these programs, but everybody does case management. I even do case management. I mean, really to us, that case management, we really take a team approach to it. So we sit down at the table. We have Monday morning meetings that we call Monday morning mayhem because Mondays are mayhem. And we sit down every morning. We talk about what the week is like. What do you need? What do our clients need? And what happened over the weekend? Because unfortunately, most of us work every weekend because they need things over the weekend. We're in the hospitals. We're delivering babies. We're taking, we're teaching people to drive. We're trying to figure out why your water bill got turned off. Oh, it's because you didn't send it to us. Um, We're delivering groceries. We're taking care of sick babies. All those things that it doesn't matter if it's a Saturday or Sunday. It has to be done. And they don't know how to get it done without calling one of us. So, so every Monday morning, we have our Monday morning mayhem, and then we follow it back up on Fridays with a staff meeting, and we take that team approach. So it's a very, we all do case management. Um, I really want every case manager to know our clients because I want them to be able to walk in the door, and if their, their official case manager is not there, I want somebody else to be able to pick up where they left off and provide them with what they need. Um, what was the other question? You the other one was a question about if you don't have a great oh, deal. if you don't have a great deal of time. Mentoring is a wonderful, but what if somebody doesn't have a large yeah. amount of time to commit? So you can be on our transportation list as a, we'll call you, and if you say no, great, nice to hear from you. You can drive once a month. You can, if you have special handyman skills and you can hook up a washing machine, you want to do that once or twice. You can come answer the phone for us. Our phones, yes, they are terrible. I've ordered a new phone system. I'm just waiting for it to be installed. So if you've ever called me and tried to get a voicemail, I don't even know if I have one. I'm not sure. But uh, we're just waiting for it to be installed. So um, you can come answer phones. You can greet clients. You can accept donations. So as Nancy said, we have this off-site storage facility for household items, but there at the International Center, we have um, a room where it houses our clothing, which used to be abysmal, but is now fantastic. I have a volunteer. I will not name her by name, but she has come in and she needed a project. Her kids all went to college and she needed a project and it is as organized as, as it's ever been. It's wonderful in there. So now we are back to accepting some clothing. It's hanging on racks organized by sizes and boxes. It's wonderful. So you can come and do that because we always get clothing in in a, in a garbage bag, but the new process is it can't sit there for more than a day and it better get back in that room because <laughs> you know how it was before. It was terrible. So you can come and do that. You can sort clothes. Um, we've tried to put some books in the, in the office. Um, Set up a little library so kids can come in and get books if they come if they want to, and many of them do. Um, so you could come in and organize the books that are on the shelves. There are so many things that you come in, we will put you to work. You want to do something with the youth that you don't have six months or two hours every week to commit? I will find something for you to do. Like I said, we have um, sometimes once, sometimes twice a month activities that we do, group activities. We do field trips. We need chaperones for. We need help with transportation. If you want to make snacks and you like to make brownies, whatever. Our kids, you know, like most teenagers, love to eat. Um, So there's always something that we can put you to work doing. And we appreciate every moment that you have built. So I'll tell you a couple of things that we're doing. November the 12th, we are partnering with the UofL School of Nursing. And we're doing um, a health fair at First Christian Church. And it is specific for car seat safety, dental hygiene promotion, as you heard we desperately need, um, and stress and coping. So one way in which I will readily admit that I think Owensboro is failing, especially our Afghan refugees, is mental health. 
they are struggling. The children are struggling. I was at a school this morning, again, for children who aren't going to school because of the anxiety that they're having. We have adults that are struggling. And it's not just here. It's everywhere. I'm on webinars. Uh, Clay was at a preacher committee meeting in Berea, and a woman approached him from Frankfurt to give resources about what they're doing in Lexington and Louisville to address this problem. It's widespread, but I think it's something that Owensboro can do. We, it's a conversation that, that we really need to have, and I'm committed to getting that done here in just a couple weeks when I get through my end of fiscal year reporting. <laughs> but it's something that we really desperately need. So this health fair is going to tackle a little bit of stress and coping. Um, and the car seat safety, a lot of them will put their babies in the car seat, but they don't want to buckle them. So we're trying to explain, well, you have to buckle. Um, so that we're going to do that on November the 12th for two hours. It should be a fun event. We're going to have a fall festival type atmosphere so the kids will have fun. We're going to provide some breakfast, coffee, hot chocolate. Um, it should be a really fun event. So if you want to, at First Christian Church. It's going to be 9 to 11 on November the 12th. The other thing, the health department is partnering with us, and we're going to offer COVID and flu vaccines as well. So we have a lot of them that don't have their, their boosters or their second round of COVID shots. So we're pulling all that information together, and we're going to be offering that, that as well. So that's on November the 12th. Um, the other exciting thing that I've been working with Lindsay, we have been working together, OCTC, Catholic Charities, the International Center, we have a really great opportunity with some funding that the state has allocated for displaced students to be able to, to continue their education and or technical training for free, 100% for free. And that includes tuition. It will help with their uh, lodging, their books. It's such an incredible opportunity, and we've been trying to figure out how to take advantage of it. So what we're trying to do is put together cohorts of our clients that can, whether they want to do the TechX program here or a CNA program or a phlebotomy program, put them together in groups according to their English level. So that's where Lindsay and OCTC are coming in, and they're really working with our clients. We're trying to identify the proper appropriate groups that they can work together, put an ESL instructor within that cohort, and get them through. Build up their English a little bit, put them through a training, and hopefully that will give them the opportunity to advance within a job. I mean, we, I'm, I don't want to knock any sort of manufacturing company, so I'm not going to name anybody in particular. We have a lot of our clients at one particular company and they're just there, and they're not going to go anywhere. Lindsay, I don't really know how to say this and be. Yeah, they're just they're going to be there forever, and there's no room for advancement. And they're, and we want them to be able to succeed. So we want to give them some education. Well, so many of them don't have the English to get a four-year degree. Not yet, they don't. So, but why leave this money on the table? We have this opportunity to do something. So if they can go. And, and enroll in the TechX program or get their CNA certificate or phlebotomy, it, they're going to learn their English. They're going to do it in a group of colleagues and friends that they're comfortable with. They're going to get it paid for. And on top of that, we have a little bit of federal funding that I'll be able to use as incentive. Congress continues to approve money for Afghans. And, but there's a fine line between enabling them and and wanting them to be self-sufficient. So the idea that we have put together and what we think could be a, a really great model for other communities is, okay, if they're enrolling in one of these training programs in these cohorts and they're going to the extra ESL that we're trying to create, we're trying to implement a Saturday class so they can go to even if they're working and going to school. We will continue to help pay for their rent and utilities. ESL situation. Uh -huh. Is there a way that you can or have utilized those Afghanis that spoke English coming here and organize and or use them as a catalyst for the others? For e than totally looking outside of the network. Yeah. For ESL? Yes. Yeah, they are really supportive of each other. 
yes, they do help each other with the ESL. The I would say the problem is that they're all working right now. There's not one of them that's not working. So what's happened is they all went to work. Most of them are working till 7.30 at night. The ESL class has already started. So they're missing the daytime classes, the two daytime classes that are offered, and the two evening classes. They're just missing them. So what we're trying to do is put together a Saturday class to say if you're willing to come from 9 to noon on a Saturday, um, that if you do that or you enroll in the training program, then, then we'll be able to utilize some of this funding to help continue to pay for your rent and your, your utilities. And those those interpreters will be there, yes. They it seems like you need someone that speaks both yeah. Afghani or whatever they, they will be there, but I'll... To be able to work with the ones that don't speak the language. Yeah. I'll tell you what what's actually... Yeah. But I think what I've learned, I thought the same thing, but what I've learned is you actually just need people that speak English. And I don't know, Thomas, if you can attest to that, but... Absolutely. It really, in Lindsay's advice, they say, I thought the same. It, that you just need that people to speak to them conversationally, Practice. even is good. Yeah, I mean, there's much to say, but um, the great thing about teaching English is it's okay to just speak English. Yeah. Um, and there are methods that you use to, to meet people in the middle and to help yeah. them. Yeah, but they are there as a support for them to ask questions. Our, our interpreters, the ones that were so helpful to us in the hotel and even the, the ones that have come since, are really great. I'll say that's the silver lining to what we went through in the hotel is that they really did create a sense of community that I don't know many other Afghan populations that have this. And they will say that same th thing to you. They got to know each other. They lived together for four months. So they really do have a strong bond and sense of community and support of one another uh, that I'm really grateful for because they, they are becoming more and more self-sufficient day by day. I get fewer and fewer calls from the 200 of them than I ever, and they all have my number. Every single one of them have my number. My husband is just like, it is 2 o'clock in the morning. Who is, which one's texting you? But they really are, and I love that. I, sometimes I'm, it's bittersweet for me because... I was just saying to some of them, we were all saying, we miss the hotel because we loved being together. I don't know if any of you all feel that way, but it was a it was a wonderful time, a special time for all of us to be together and get to know such lovely people. So I hope I answered the questions and rambled on long enough. Diane, can I, yes? Just the, the discussion about ESL. We have women who want to come to ESL classes and we're limited because we don't have daycare. First Christ, or, uh, Owensboro Christian Church has volunteers <laughs> who take care of kids yes, there. they do. And if, we, if they had more help, we could get more moms into the ESL classes. It's like two hours on Monday and two Look, hours on Look, Lindsay's Monday. got her hand raised. You want to volunteer and you could stand little kids? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we coordinate that, so OCTC actually provides those classes at Owensboro Christian Church on Monday and Wednesday, and we coordinate yeah, and, and we're actually looking at doing that on Saturdays, looking at more volunteers to do the childcare and the English, uh, because it really is hard to find um, teachers that would, you don't have to be a teacher. The, they can train you. Lindsay has assured me that they can train you very easily. And one of our caseworkers went the other night and did a great job, I heard. And she just wants to do it on her extra time. I mean, she works weekends. She works all the time. But she wants to go help with English. So if you're, if you're interested in that at all, my teenage daughter, um, she even wants to help. So The grant we have pays for total cost of attendance, including child care. So if yeah. there is a cost for the child care, the grant covers that. The That's right. Grant. Yes, that's right. In case you didn't hear, the, the grant covers the child care as well. It, and it covers transportation costs. Total cost of to, Yeah, total cost. So, I mean, we can really make this work. We just need, we need volunteers. Yeah. You said something about the rules for the um, Ukrainians being so much stricter than for the Afghans. I'm not understanding that. Is this a thing? Well, it is, and I'll tell you why. Because they, they think that the Ukrainians will want to go back. So there's no, there's no avenue for permanent residency. 
and that's why they did the U.S. sponsor route, or so we've been told, because they, they envision that at the end of the conflict that most Ukrainians will choose to go back. Now, whether any you know whether you believe that that's going to be an option or not at the end of this war, I'm not sure. But that was most Ukrainians will say that that uh, you know they want to go back. And I'll say we don't have any men; they're all women, women with their children because their men are their husbands are there fighting. But um, but that that's why they still the only thing that we cannot do for them is enroll them in the reception and placement program that initial 90-day program. So they don't get that welcome money. And that we can't do that because they set it up with a U.S. sponsor. So the U.S. sponsor, ideally, the way it's supposed to work is that U.S. sponsor is supposed to help them get here and help them find a house. But then we can enroll them in one of those programs after, whether it's RCA or Match Grant. And that's what we did for these two Ukrainian families in Evansville. They had already... They already have a house. They already have a, a little bit of a support system there, but they just needed some help paying their rent and utilities, so we enrolled them in a program to help them do that and, and told them that we'd be here for whatever else they may need. Do you know roughly how many international centers there are in the U.S.? Like, like, like ours? Well, there are nine what we call vo VOLAGs, which are the volunteer agencies that the State Department contracts, through, that ORR, Office of Refugee Resettlement, provides their funding for, right? There are nine of those. So I would, I don't know, but that's a good question. They're spread out all over the United States. Um, in Kentucky, there are five. So there's one in Lexington, Louisville, Owensboro, Bowling Green, and Covington just opened last year. That's a good question, though. I can certainly find out. I should know that. Yes. Earlier, you mentioned that uh, there was going to be a large group coming from Colombia. We just happen to have a large group coming in a couple weeks from Colombia. Yeah. Okay. How, how large a group is it, and why Colombia? Well, I don't know why Colombia, but we have <laughs> this particular group that we've assured, like in one day, I think we have three families coming from Colombia. And we've assured several from Colombia. Aside from that, there are, of course, a lot of Cuban, Cuban Haitians, in, but we have not really received a lot as refugees. Now, there may be some in Owensboro, but we have not really received many into our office. But Bowling Green and Lexington and Louisville have. Um, I'm not sure why Colombia. Uh, I don't know. This was new to me. So we, we honestly do not know. We just get the travel. First, I get the assurance on a, on a secure site from the U.S. State Department that says, will you assure this case? And they're saying, will you, but if I don't assure it, they're going to assure it for me. So, so I assure the case, and then I just wait to get a travel notification. So I might assure a case in July and not get travel notification until September. So I don't, and I don't really know why. Every now and then they'll give me a little, they might send me and say, oh, it's a security at this particular stop. It's hung up for whatever reason. But most of the time we don't know. And we just wait for that travel notification to come in. And we don't plan the travel, the international flights. IOM does that. Um, we just get the travel and we pick them up in Evansville. And we get, we get a little bit of information. Sometimes we get a lot and sometimes we get very little what they call their bio data. So we get that bio data. We try to send that on to the health department so that they can start scheduling all of their um, health assessments and um, any follow-up appointments. And, um, you know, Owensboro has been really, just really great at, in working with us to set up, you know, it was just such a, it really was just kind of a mess when they first came for all of us. But we worked through processes. We worked through processes at the hospital with the emergency room. The first couple times, it was not very smooth. So we made a few phone calls, and we sat down, and we figured out a system, and now it works great. We needed private practice providers, and now we have private practice providers, OBGYNs and orthopedists, and that are willing to treat our patients and see our clients 
sometimes even before they have a Medicaid card, because sometimes we can't get it soon enough, but they need to be treated. And that's not their fault. It's not their fault they don't have that card, but they're here and they need help. So the churches that have re- continued to deliver them food, and I cannot tell you how proud I am of Owensboro. And when Nancy mentioned the New York Times reporter, she was astounded. She followed me around for two days and said, I cannot believe a community this size is doing what you're doing. She said, it's like, she said, you need something, Diane, and you make one phone call, and then it just appears. <laughs> and I said, that's Owensboro, and I didn't grow up here, so I can say that in an unbiased way. Owensboro still astounds me. I'm proud every single day to live here, and I believe that whatever it is that is on this list that we need, I just keep saying we'll get it done. And we do. Somehow it just happens because of all these people up here sitting on this panel, because the people in this room, because AAUW says let's have a discussion and talk about it. And I'm grateful because it's not one person or one office. It's the entire community that has to continue to talk about what they need, to talk about how we can meet them where they are, and how to get them to the very next step so that they have a long, successful life here. That, that's our goal. I think that's what we all want. And I know I've said it, and I'll just keep saying it. I'm very proud of Owensboro, and you're doing a great job. So <laughs> keep doing it. Oh, yes. Do, uh, do they still have to repay their flights? They do, their travel loans. Yes, that is one thing, that, and that's on them. They have to pay, refugees have to pay for their travel to get to the United States. They get an IOM loan, but it's very expensive, and so um, thousands of dollars for large families. They also have to pay for their green card application um, in that process, which is also expensive. So, so that is something that, that I've been doing. I've also been raising money for, for those things. Um, and, and putting money aside for when a family comes in and they cannot pay a family of nine and they only have two working parents to try to help them with those IOM loans and that, that green card process. Um, so we really, we really are trying to t- go the extra step because I believe that we should. Um, it's really hard for them if, if you think about them being successful here. They have no framework of support how are they supposed to figure this out when we all have somebody we can call, right? We have a friend, we have a grandmother, an, an aunt, a neighbor. They don't have anybody. So it's on us to give them a somebody. And so maybe you're so inclined to be that somebody. Or you can write, always write a check. It's a tax-deductible donation. <laughs> Take that, that too. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> I want to just suggest that all of you, if you haven't before, um, find their web, uh, find their email, uh, Facebook page. It's uh, it's beautiful. It, it's right now very moving uh, with some of the uh, things that are are there. Um, I want to thank our panel for coming tonight um, on kind of our crazy idea a month ago, saying, well. We were having a discussion and we, we didn't have answers and goes well let's get people together and let's just talk about what's going on and that's how this all happens so we thank you for coming and taking your time to do this